Hi everybody and welcome to our first lecture about Everything's in Argument, which is our textbook for the class. This will be about chapter one, but I think it's important to note that this lecture, nor any of the other lectures we're going to do in this lecture series, are directly from the book or fully comprehensive. So it's very, very important that you're reading as well as watching these lecture videos because I'm not going to address everything that the book goes over and I'm also going to add some things that the book doesn't address. So it's really, really important that you're doing both. One thing that you'll notice at the beginning of each lecture is that there's going to be a lecture preview, which is really just going to function as a brief agenda to show you what we're going to be addressing in each lecture. So first and foremost today we're going to address what is an argument, then we're going to talk about rhetoric, we'll talk about the rhetor rhetorical or Aristotelian appeals, Aristotle's four uses of argument, why we argue, and then we'll go over the four different types of arguments that we're going to address in this class. So first and foremost, we need to address what is an argument. Now at this point, I'd like you to pause the video and take a minute or two and see if you can answer this question. Define what an argument is. And when you start the video back up, we're gonna jump into what your textbook says counts as an argument. So now that you're back, we are going to look at the textbook definition of an argument. And that says that anything that expresses a point of view counts as an argument. Now what we'll do a lot in this class as well is a lot of deconstructing or deeply analyzing and breaking down arguments, sentences, you know, whatever it might be, to its component parts and looking at it. So part of deconstructing something means that we look at individual words, keywords, that make up a claim. So the claim here is that anything, an argument is anything that expresses a point of view. The keyword there is going to be anything. So in my mind I think anything. Okay, what about shirts? bumper stickers, books, jokes. Stand-up comedians are pretty well known for making arguments or hiding arguments in their jokes and sometimes those are problematic and sometimes they're not. Pictures or movies. Now if you compare what you wrote down for what is an argument and if you think about the definition anything that expresses a point of view if we go by that definition which we're going to because I think it's pretty accurate all of those examples, shirts, bumper stickers, books of jokes, pictures, and movies, they all can function as an argument. And that's why we have this nice Nike advertisement here, because that is making an argument. It is telling you to do something. Now, if we were in a live class at this point, we would do an activity, but it's a recorded lecture, so we'll skip the activity for the time being and move on to the next stop on our lecture journey here, which is going to be rhetoric according to Aristotle. Now, rhetoric is a term that is used pretty often. We hear rhetorical questions. We hear people talking about problematic or damaging or dangerous rhetoric. But we don't often hear people talking about what rhetoric is. Now, rhetoric was developed by, was, is a concept developed by Aristotle. And Aristotle was the first person to, first documented person to apply scientific rigor to how human beings use their voice, use their body, use their words to get other people to do things. He added a systemized approach to analyzing particularly public speaking because in ancient Greek and Roman societies the ability to speak, to be an orator, or to be an effective orator was really really important. So Aristotle applied some met, what we would call methods to analyzing how people use their voice, use their language to achieve different goals. Aristotle ultimately defined rhetoric as the artful use of language to shape the heart, the mind, or the will of some human or human enterprise. This will be the definition we're going to use for this class. There's a billion definitions of rhetoric out there, but to me it makes sense to go with the definition that was developed by the person who created the concept. And I also find the definition to be really accurate for what we have going on in modern society in 2021. But Aristotle took it a little bit further and didn't just create the concept and define it, but actually gave us some different things to think about when we are addressing rhetoric. And those are going to be your rhetorical appeals. And those are ethos, pathos, and logos. But he also developed four uses of rhetoric, plus a lot of other things. But we're just going to go over these two these two things for the uses of this class. So many of you have likely heard of rhetorical appeals. 
and we hear Ethos Pathos logos and there are other ones but these are the three primary ones that we want to think about when we are arguing and when we're analyzing arguments. So Ethos is commonly referred to as ethics but it's actually our appeal or appeals to credibility which kind of makes sense with why we think about it as being ethics because if your audience doesn't perceive you as being ethical then they probably won't perceive you as being credible they won't listen to you so it's very very important that we have appeals to credibility that we tell our audience without directly telling them why they should listen to us why they should take us seriously and we do that through a variety of different means but one of them has to do with how we are perceived and if we're perceived as being ethical if our audience thinks that we're not ethical or thinks that we're lying to them they likely will not listen to us or take us as seriously the second rhetorical appeal is pathos or pathos these are our appeals to emotion uh, as you all know human beings are incredibly emotional creatures and when we are not using our brain and we're thinking more emotionally we sometimes don't make the best decisions now as somebody who is designing an argument or using rhetoric using artful use of language to shape the heart the mind or the will of some human or human enterprise being able to tap into your audience's emotion is a very very powerful tool it can help you get your audience to do what you want them to do but with that comes a little bit of uh, you have to find a balance with your credibility and with your ethics because you don't want to just bombard your audience with emotion because as you know as we've talked about already humans are wildly emotional and if you think about it for yourself we as individuals often don't make the best decisions when we are thinking and making decisions based off our emotion. We're gonna talk a lot about that. So it's really, really important that you're comfortable with the concept of pathos or appeals to emotion. Last but not least, we have logos, which for this class, we're going to think of as appeals to logic and reasoning. The reasoning aspect is gonna be the really important part here because I want you to start to think about the reasons why we make the arguments that we make or why we hear other people, why other people make their arguments. So these are our rhetorical appeals. It's really, really important that you remember them. Ethos appeals to credibility. Pathos or pathos appeals to emotion. Logos appeals to logic and reasoning. But Aristotle took it a step further and made a, some claims about where and when rhetoric is useful. So these four are not super important for you to memorize, but it's important for you to know because it will help us get a firm understanding of how we as individuals can use rhetoric to achieve different goals. So number one, by it, it being rhetoric, truth and justice maintain their natural superiority. So the claim that's being made here, the stance that Aristotle was taking is that truth and justice are naturally superior to other things. And by using rhetoric by thinking about rhetoric through a scientific or systematized way systematic way we can help maintain that truth and justice that comes with those concepts now my personal issue with this one this particular idea is that truth and justice are not natural they're not naturally superior to anything you wouldn't find truth and justice just out in the wilderness or at the bottom of the ocean they are human created concepts based on our individual ideas about right and wrong, about our morals, our ethics, our values. They're very culturally based. Those ideas about what is true, how we interact with truth and honesty and justice, those are based on a lot of different things that aren't found in nature necessarily. So I have a little bit of an issue with this first one according to Aristotle, but you're more than welcome to come to your own conclusion about what you think of this use of rhetoric. Aristotle's second use of rhetoric is that rhetoric is suited for popular audiences since they can't follow scientific demonstration. I tend to agree with this. I know I personally have a hard time sometimes following scientific demonstrations to a T and it can be really challenging for a lot of people. So think about for yourself, does this fit for you? Does this fit to what you see in the world or what you've experienced? Would using language in a particular way really be suited for popular audiences because 
they don't necessarily always have or ever have the necessary training to follow a scientific demonstration. I think that says a lot about the views on a lot of different things. So that's what Aristotle felt was useful about rhetoric for popular audiences and why. Again, I'll let you decide if you agree or not. Number three, and this is a really, really important aspect or the concept that Aristotle developed, and that's that rhetoric teaches us to see both sides of an issue and to refute unfair arguments. Now this is really, really important that you remember because we're going to circle back to this throughout the next 16 weeks or so, however long our, our class is. We're going to circle back to this idea of a balcony stance. And the balcony stance is this idea that we as rhetoricians we remove ourselves from the artifact, from the subject, from the thing that we are analyzing. We take how we feel, our glandular reactions, our likes, our dislikes about it. We remove those and we look at it from a purely systematic, purely analytical and as objective as possible perspective. The idea is called the balcony stance and it's the idea that you remove yourself and you're looking down on the the thing whatever it is from above so you can see everything that's going on now if you think about this from if you go to a play or you go to a movie a concert a sporting event anything where you're sitting higher up you can see more of what's going on and that's the idea here this is where we get to this idea about being able to refute unfair arguments we're removing ourselves from that particular situation, removing our emotions, removing our, our personal biases and those things so that we can just analyze it for what it is and to see the entire playing field and to analyze the strategies and, and those types of things. So the balcony stance is really, really important for you to remember. And building from that idea of the balcony stance and being able to refute unfair arguments, Aristotle also believed that rhetoric and having an understanding of rhetoric acts as a means of self-defense because when we are removed from that situation we can see everything that's going on we are able to be more prepared to be for people trying to persuade us we are harder to persuade we're harder to manipulate we're better critical thinkers because we are emotionally removed from that thing and we are looking literally looking down on it and analyzing it as a whole for its strengths, for its weaknesses. So this makes us, having this understanding will hopefully make us better critical thinkers, better arguers, harder to persuade, harder to convince to really do anything. So those are Aristotle's four uses of rhetoric. You don't need to necessarily memorize them, but it's really, really important that you get comfortable and you remember that concept of the balcony stance where we are figuratively removing ourselves so that we can analyze something, analyze whatever it is in a deeper manner. Okay, so at this point we've talked about that what an argument is. We've talked about rhetoric, but we haven't really addressed you know, why we argue. Many people will say that they don't like to argue or they avoid arguing because they don't like the conflict or whatever it might be. But what I would like for you to do at this point is start to shift the way that you're thinking about arguing. And don't think about it as a win or lose type of situ situation. You don't win or lose most arguments. Most of the arguments that we're making are much, much more subtle. We argue for a variety of different reasons. We argue to convince. We want somebody to agree with us or to disagree or we're convincing somebody of something, right? We do this all the time, whether you like to argue or not. You probably have tried to convince somebody to go out to eat at a particular restaurant or something. We argue to inform. So maybe we are trying to inform somebody about something and we're making a claim. We're saying this is important to know. You're making an argument there. You might not be saying, you know, this is my stance, but you're saying this is important for you to know. And that in itself is a claim and an argument. We often argue to persuade people to do things. So there's a difference between convince and persuade. We'll talk about it when we get, get to it. But when we're trying to persuade somebody, we're trying to get them to physically take action, to do something, to physically do something, not just to convince somebody that maybe it's a good or bad idea. We're trying to convince people to make certain decisions. This is a pretty common one. Again, where do we want to eat? What movie do we want to watch? What do we want to watch on TV? Uh, where should we go on vacation? 
whatever that might be. We often argue to understand. So maybe you are trying to learn a new concept, you're learning a new idea, and you want to bounce some ideas off of a friend or a family member, a colleague, or a classmate. You might play devil's advocate and take a different stance just to help both of you or whoever's in that group to better understand any particular idea or concept. And we often argue to explore, to explore new ideas, to engage in things in a different way. That's incredibly healthy and it gives you a really good opportunity to see something from a variety of different perspectives. So we have four particular types of arguments that we are going to analyze and talk about for this class. The first two are arguments of fact and arguments of definition. Now if you can, as we're working through this, pause occasionally and try and write down an example, something that you think might relate to the different types of arguments. So we have four total, the first two are here. So an argument of fact is a true or false type statement. And the key aspect to these is that they can be proven or disproven. They are what we might consider to be objectively true or objectively false. It's one or the other. There's no gray area. There's a clear line drawn in the sand. It's either true or it's false. It can't be either one. It can't be something in between. So think about how we use that term, the, the term fact, how we use it in our day-to-day -day lives, but also how do we use it when we're actually making an argument of fact. It's going to be really, really important later on. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about this particular type of argument. The second type of argument is called an argument of definition. And this is a type of argument that doesn't say true or false. It argues about what is a thing? What is a thing used for? Say if you are um, laying on a table and somebody says, what are you doing? You know, That's not what that's used for. They're making an argument saying that you are improperly using that thing. Right? You're going to have your hearing an argument of definition. So you're going to hear arguments like, what is a thing? What does something qualify as a certain category? And these can go from objects all the way up to really large, very important cultural and political ideas. Has a definition changed over time? So this is a really, really big one. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about this as well. We want to think about how definitions change over time. And we need to do that by addressing two different types of definitions. So first we have denotative definitions. These are dictionary definitions. And then we have connotative definitions. And these are our contextual definitions. Again, don't worry too much about fully understanding these different types of arguments right now. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about them later on. But I want you to get start to get comfortable with the vocabulary and be able to understand what an argument of fact is, what an argument of definition is, and some of the different terminology that's going to go with those different types of arguments. Moving on, we have our final two types of arguments. Those are arguments of evaluation and arguments of proposal. So arguments of evaluation argue about what the value of a thing is. Is it worth what you're paying for it? Is it worth paying attention to? Is it worth being worried about or stressing about? Those are arguments of evaluation. They present standards and then measure ideas against those standards. So for example, if you are talking about some kind of food and you say this is the best kind of food, you have to give us some standards to go by. Is it about the texture? Is it about the seasoning? Is it about um, the way it's cooked? Whatever it might be. So you are going to present those standards and then make your case, make your argument for saying based on these things, this is good, bad, right or wrong. So some of the key words that you're going to hear are going to be value terms like good or bad, right or wrong moral, immoral, ethical, unethical, those types of things. And last but not least, we have arguments of proposal. So these are arguments addressing what should we do? What should we eat? Where should we go? Should we do something about that or do something about something? Should we get engaged? Those are proposal arguments. We make them all the time. So I'm sure you can probably come up with some pretty quick examples there. One of the important things to remember about arguments of proposal is that they are related to action. And again, you're going to see some keywords that are going to be things like should or should not. So should we do this or we should not do that. Those are keywords that will give you a little idea of what type of argument is being made. And this brings us to the end of our first lecture. 
So in a quick review, we addressed that an argument is anything that expresses a point of view. We defined rhetoric as the artful use of language to shape the heart, the mind, or the will of some human or human enterprise. We talked about the rhetorical appeals being ethos, pathos, and logos. Ethos appeals to credibility. Pathos appeals to emotion. Logos appeals to logic and reasoning. We talked about the four uses of rhetoric. Particularly, it's important that you remember the balcony stance and how taking that balcony stance allows us to see a situation, see an artifact, see a thing from a variety of different perspectives and from a more holistic view. And last but not least, we addressed the four different types of arguments that we are primarily going to be focusing on for this class. Those are arguments of fact, arguments of definition, arguments of evaluation, and arguments of proposal. All right, everybody, please reach out to me if you have any questions about anything that we've addressed in this lecture, and I will see you either in class or at the next lecture. Bye, everybody.